this is Eric Warren. Welcome to NetworkMarketingPro.com. Today I'm here with the squinting <laughs> Mike Dillard um, of Attraction Marketing fame. And we're here in Dallas, Texas. We're actually up uh, by the swimming pool. You might hear some people swimming in the background. But just finished a conference and Mike and I have been talking shop a little bit for the last, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, talking about different things. And um, I wanted Mike to share with you some of the concepts, maybe some of the psychology of what you can do to make yourself more attractive in the network marketing profession, what you can do to be a network marketing professional and actually have people interested in you. Sure. So first of all, um, this uh, you wrote a book on tr attraction marketing. Right. And how long ago did you write that book? Uh, Magnetic Sponsoring back in 2005. Uh, the first edition. First edition, and, and how many copies of that book have you sold since then? I honestly have never counted. Approximately. Um, I'm guessing. Between 1,500,000. 1,500,000. So, successful book. Absolutely. A lot of people have gotten benefit from it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've you know, uh, generated lots of different derivative products around that. But uh, uh, talk to everybody. What is the concept around attraction marketing? What does that mean? Mm, sure. If y'all don't mind, I am yeah, going to be the cool guy and put the, <laughs> put the shades on. Ah, much better. Okay. All right, all right. Um, well, it really started, you know, Eric, back when you were involved in TPN, it was really the first company that I ever became involved back in. Back in the day. Marketing. So, yeah, I mean, you, you, I remember you from, from back in the day when I was getting started. And um, you had to have been, what, 20 years old? 18, 19? How many years ago was that? 10? We started TPN in 1994 and uh, ended up selling it in late 1998. Yeah, I was probably around there, 18 years old, 20 years old. 18 years old, 20 years old, okay. Young and, guy. Um, and I was always enamored, and I spent the next five, six years in this industry really trying to, to figure it out and uh, achieve some success, and I really wasn't having any um, through those years. And, but I was always a, a very big student of what was going on around me and, and greater observing other people. And, I always ask myself, what is it that allows, makes those people different, allows those people to go up on stage and get the results that they're getting and build organizations very quickly and, and really have so much success with sponsoring new distributors that I wasn't able to have at the time. And um, I finally realized that it really just came down to human psychology and that this is a game of follow the leader, really. And uh, that people who are leaders do very specific things that other people do not. Uh, and how they present themselves, how they talk to other people, uh, their interactions. And that really is, is something that we are genetically programmed to respond to. And we are, again, genetically programmed to respond to, to people that we look up to and that we see as leaders. And it is kind of a pack animal mentality. You have the alpha dog, you know, the wolf pack and things like that. And the rest of the group is, is programmed to support that person and to follow them and to, you know, do whatever the, the group needs to do as a whole and as a team. And that's really what was happening in, in this industry is when you see someone on stage and, and they, you know, they're exhibiting those qualities, you can't help but be attracted to that person. And, and you, the reason that we want to do that and that we want to have an association with these people is because we have something to gain through any kind of relationship with them, whether it be being on their team, or getting to have dinner with them, uh, just to, to get knowledge. They Bra have bragging that you're part of their team, or right having some connection to some information or power or whatever. We gain power through that association. Mm -hmm. uh, we gain their knowledge, their expertise. Get to get to you know learn more about success from them. Kind of like free training, and and in the end, they get power as well through that association by again having a, a group of supporters and followers around them, and so. It was really that coming to that understanding. It's like, hey, I can I can now start talking to my prospects and my interactions and, and, and be a leader and make sure that that comes across in my communication and how I stand, how I dress. So you were like changing your image. You were changing your, you know, reinventing yourself. Absolutely. You're saying it might you're, a certain result. You were going out there and maybe you didn't have as much personal power as you wanted. So you started to create your own brand inside of the networking profession, you started to create an, a better image mm -hmm. that would get better results with prospects and yeah. with your team. Right, and I, I realized it wasn't about the company. You know, mm -hmm. when you're first in this indus industry, you you're think it's the company's gonna be responsible for my success. Well, after you try 10 different companies and you're still not successful, you start to, to realize that that's not really the case. And that if you want a certain kind of results, you have to become a, a, 
person that's capable of getting those results. And so it was really was that was that realization that if I want to build a following, I have to be the leader, and I have to act like a leader and do things that leaders do. And uh, it, that was kind of a pivotal change in me internally because I'd never really given myself permission to to have those qualities, and I was always kind of timid and shy when it came to standing up and saying, "Okay, well, guys, I'm going to lead us. Let's go." Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that was a, a pivotal change. It's interesting. I, I had the same kind of thought process, but I will tell you, I didn't. You know, write a book about it. Mm. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, document the stuff. But I went from, you know, I had 18 jobs before I started in the profession, mm -hmm. and I was 22. Right. And I said, you know, this is an opportunity for me to reinvent myself with my organization, with other people, and create a brand. So I really worked on it. I mean, right. I was a real student of personal development. I was a, you know, I I, I watched what other leaders did. Mm. Really. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a difference sometimes of what top leaders do and what they say they do and I'm not saying that they're misleading you it's just sometimes they don't train what they do right. as, as as good as they actually kind of instinctively do some of those things does that make sense well that or that or I think some of them are afraid that if they really told you what they did I don't they... think no do you think so <laughs> I don't think the leaders are afraid to tell you what they really do at all I think some of them just have a hard time articulating I, I agree with that I what it is that they do articulating you know how to write sales copy I, you know yeah you yeah. just you, some of some people just are gifted in certain ways or or their their series of life circumstances have led them to have some characteristics that mm -hmm. become attractive to other people. Right. So I don't think anybody's like trying to hide any secrets. No, no, really, no. truly. No. I just don't think some of them, I, I watch, I mean, there's some leaders that I followed and they would do their standard training up on the stage and then I would watch what they really did right. and there was a disconnect there with some of the things that they really did and how they, how they uh, built influence with their organizations and, and those types of things. And then when I would talk to them about that, they say, "Yeah, you know, that's a good point. I got to change my training." And mm -hmm. some of them would change their training yeah. to, to show what they actually did. Well, let's talk about some of the things when you were reinventing yourself, mm -hmm. which I like that concept because right. there's a lot of people out there that say, "You know what? I need to like shake the dust off of all the stuff that I've done up until this point and reinvent myself." Um, you know, walk me through the metamorphosis uh -huh. of kind of. What's the first thing, what, what's one of the concepts that you had to really look at first? Well, you know, the first thing you do is take an accounting of your weaknesses, you know, where everybody knows where they're weak and, and what they've been making excuses for themselves for. You just really stop and be honest with yourself. I know that I'm making excuses in this area of my life. Um, and it really just comes down to facing that. And for me, I was a very shy person. I hated calling people on the phone, even if these were leads that had said, hey, give me information about your business. I would sit there for hours at my desk, fiddling with my spreadsheets, you know, go out and buy a new headset, whatever I had to do to not pick up the phone. And I, I knew that that was not acceptable and that was not going to get me the result that I wanted. And um, it, was, it was ironic that, I don't remember who told me this, but someone did and I never forgot it, is that a lot of times we're willing to do for other people what we're not willing to do for ourselves. Right. And at that time I wasn't willing to do that for myself. I wasn't capable of, of having the discipline or the, the courage to do that. So I went out and I got a job uh, recruiting surgeons that basically required me to hold call two to three hundred doctor's offices a day. Wow. And, uh, and I did it with the sole intention of acquiring that skill set and getting over that fear. Um, and I did, you know, they sat me down on day one, my cube was empty other than a telephone and a binder this thick with doctor's offices, they start here and dial. And by the second day, there was no more phone fear because there's no one more brutal on the telephone than a, a, a surgeon's gatekeeper. Keeper, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> try, to, try to get a hold of a surgeon through a nurse, you know, or someone else, and it's, it's not an easy thing to do. But, you know, two to three days later, I was the king of the phone. There's nothing in the world that could scare so me. So it didn't take you long? Two, three days. And, again, it just all of a sudden it came down to the fact that, well, I was willing to do it for my new boss in this new environment. And all of a sudden it's just like, well, I'm here. I have to do it. Um, and then, boom, it was over. So that was that was number well, one. And let, me, yeah. and let me talk about a few, a few things that I hear out of that. Yeah. Um, one is that a lot of people in network marketing, they say, treat this like a business. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I one of the phrases I heard um, from a gentleman, his name was Antonio Adair. Great concept. He said, "Treat this like a job." Mm, right. 
until I mean, you're making enough money to treat it like a business. Right. You know, because if you treat what you had to do is you treat it like a job. There's nothing else to do. You had to go do it. Right. But then when in network marketing, there's all these other things that can get in the way. And, you know, I have the sniffles or, mm. you know, my cat got sick today. I don't feel like it. Sure. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, go buy a new headset. All that other kind yeah. of avoidance behavior. Um, second thing is you said you were a shy person. Mm. And I will tell you. Just about every top income earner I know is fairly introverted. Mm -hmm. Not every, but I would say probably 80%. Right. You know, they're, they're shy, introverted people that just, just figured out a skill set and went after it right. and made it, made it happen. Um, the third thing that I heard out of that is have some self-awareness and evaluation of what are the things that you need to figure out in order to be able to be successful. Right. What are your limiting beliefs, right. and then what are your deficiencies in skill? Because there's only a half a dozen, right? Sure. That you have to that you have to master here inside of network marketing in order to be able to be world class. Absolutely. Um, and there, none of them are, you know, brain surgery. Right. I mean, you don't have to go to ten years of school. You just have to spend three days making yeah. two or three hundred phone calls and get over your phone call yeah. fear and move on with it, versus deal with phone call fear for the next five years. I'd be frustrated yeah. and I can't that was my biggest my biggest regret is that I spent five years trying to find a way around this fear instead of just dealing with it Go through it. And, and most people you know by the time you're in your 20s 30s 40s who are getting into this industry for the first time already have these skill sets I was 18 19 years old at the time 20. I wouldn't say that there's a lot of people that never had that skill set yeah. because they you know they're in a bit of profession that didn't require them to to interact with people every day, mm -hmm. or they only had to interact with three or four people that they really knew well. Sure. You know, so that a lot of people haven't developed a certain skill, and when they come in to start a new business, it's a different yeah. skill. Yeah. So, okay, so so one is you kind of examined your fear of talking to people. Sure. Okay. What what else did you did you do to kind of reinvent yourself? Uh, well, the next step was is is a fear of personal selling. You know, interaction in, in the real world, not on the telephone. Um, not being shy in front of someone, uh, you know, a big thing for me was here I am in my early 20s, how, why is someone in their 30s, 40s, or 50s going to take me seriously? What the hell you do had I know? an insecurity What there. the hell do I know, you know, about business right. and, and how am I supposed to sponsor someone like that? So the, the first technique worked so well I went and did it again and I got a, a job in Dallas again with an outside sales company selling broadband telecom services to high rises like we have here. So you literally just did you just get a job just to work there for a little while? Yeah. Just literally to face the fear. Just to get the skill set. So then you yeah. said, thanks for yeah. you know for, for having me. I made my six hundred calls with the telemarketing thing and you're done? Well I mean I was there, you know, I stayed there to you know, obviously I had to pay the bills. And Policy the money skills. I, okay, so you had a little bit of a job there while you were working. Probably I think for about a year or so. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, okay. And that I, money I, went to I, leads I, and yeah, okay. training and all that. Sure, so, sure, sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so and let me back up by asking a different question. We have this debate all the time. Are mm. we in the selling business? Mm. Are we in the marketing business? Mm -hmm. Are we in the sharing business? Mm. What do you think? Um, you know, I, I, I'd have to say I, I have a saying that I, I guess I, I wrote in, in Magnetic Sponsoring years ago, and, it, and I kind of sum it up like this, is that network marketing is an industry of marketing and promotion pursued by people who typically do not know how to market or promote. Okay. Um, and so you think it's a marketing business? Well, I think it's a marketing promotion, promotion business. business because typically we have tools provided to us yep. that do the selling. Yep. Uh, in the end, it is selling. And third party is so important to get any duplication in your organizations. Yep. Absolutely. Like if you can give me a tape or a CD or a presentation of what kind, that's going to do the selling. And so my job is to use marketing and promotion to get that tape out to 10,000 people. Right. Whatever may be the internet. I like that. The website. So that's that's kind of how I see it. Is, is we don't have to be personal salespeople per se. We have to be extra promoters. Um, and to take an existing sales message like a sales letter that we deal with in internet right. marketing. And how can we promote that now and become effective at marketing that message? All right. So I interrupted you. So mm -hmm. back to you faced fear number two, which was going out there and personally persuading somebody to do something that they hadn't done. Yeah, so, you know, basically it entailed coming up to high rises in, in downtown Dallas, getting past the security guard at the front, starting on the top floor, and then start knocking on doors and selling our broadband service oh, to tell the security guard. It gives me, man, it gives me yeah. the willies just no, thinking hated, about it. I hated oh every, my god. I hated every single moment of it, and I wanted it done and over with as fast <laughs> as possible. That, that one lasted a month or two. Oh. Um, 
But again, by the time I was done, but you I got that. I mean, it was different, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and it was it was worth it. And that's that's the one thing about this industry is, uh, I mean, if your your passion and your, and your goal is strong enough, I was literally willing to do anything uh, to make it in this industry. And, and there was another point. Now, in, yeah. again, do you think it's industry or profession? Oh, I don't. Never really just say, it just say profession. Profession, because it's a, it, it is a profession. It is, it, absolutely. This is what we do, guys. It's not a lotto ticket. There's a lots of different industries: cosmetic industry, and nutritional industry, and all these other industries inside of our profession. But what we do is we are network marketing professionals. All right. So anyway, um, yeah. I mean, it's true. I mean, you can't earn, expect to earn a professional's income without actually. Right. Becoming a true profession at it. Right. So. Yeah. All right. So so you got past that. And now you're gaining some personal power. Right. And you, you're starting to feel stronger about yourself when mm -hmm. somebody else says, "Oh, I'm worried about this." You can say, "Look, relax. Right. You know, it's not that big a deal. I've been through it. You know, mm -hmm. come on, let's just go piano." Right. All right. What's the next step? What did you do after that? Uh, next step is that well, now I was able to call people on the telephone. I was able to start sponsoring people. Um, it re did it make a big difference? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Just sure. from numbers increased first, right? Obviously, you know, numbers, uh, you know, I, that, at that point I could start making genealogy, I just started calling genealogy lists, making two or three hundred cold calls to that a day. And, so you're doing cold call lists? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, um, and that's when the experimentation started on the marketing side. Yeah. You know, I got the personal stuff to a, a functional point. Um, now how do we take advantage of the marketing? And it really was just an experiment of trial and error. And my goal was always to work smarter, not harder. And I saw people who were out there just, just hammering the phones, just working really hard. And I always used to ask myself and say, this, there's got to be a better way to go about this. And that's yeah. really when I came across direct response marketing and internet marketing. And I love the idea of being able to leverage the written word or written sales presentation instead of giving one on the telephone all the time. I mean, if I generate leads, I call those people on the telephone. But I don't want to cold call 200 people a day for my income, right? Um, so that's when I, I figured, well, hey, I, if I can learn how to write down a sales presentation and put it on a website and put it in an email. You basically then, created a third-party tool that you used online. And, and leveraged online. Because yeah, up until that point, I was really buying leads you know, from lead companies or calling genealogy lists. It's a tough, tough road, right? Yeah, it is. It is. And, um, and I think it's a very important process for people to go through because you learn so much from it. But uh, at that point in time, I was like, all right, I, I, need, I need more leverage in my life. So that's when I learned how to market online, put some ads on pay-per-click, and then all of a sudden I've got 20, 30, 40, 50 people contacting me per day, you know, filling out my capture form and seeing my sales presentation. And when I called them on the telephone, they knew who I was at, the, you know, at that point, finally. So let's back up for a second. Mm -hmm. So you talked about, you know, basically you created a third-party tool online mm -hmm. to be able to... You approach people using pay-per-click instead of approaching people in different ways. But basically, it was approach people, have them look at a third-party right. tool, and if they had an interest, so it was a sorting tool. But right. I want to get back to the reinvention of you. Mm. I want to get back to what what made you different. Okay, so so did did you? What made you valuable to your organization was mm. it was it the fact that you were somebody who was now knowledgeable that you had, you were experienced that did you change the way you dressed did you change the way you talked mm. did you learn how to present and you know in front of people did you communicate what were some of the things you did there that's a, yeah that's a great question um, you know it definitely acquiring value yeah. when you acquire value when you acquire skill set you. You now value yourself at a different level, which means you interact with people differently. You know, up until that point when I was talking to a prospect, they had all the power because all I had was an opportunity. Right? right? I mean, there's nothing different or special about me. There's no reason to work with me personally. All I had was a business opportunity. Here you go. And there's right. no reason for them to join me specifically. People join a person more than they join a company exactly. inside of our profession. Absolutely. Because, like you say, they they perceive a um, what's in it for them a, a benefit you know i know people join me because they feel like you know they can get a, they can make money with me right. i mean and, and i leverage that when i right. talk to people you can make money with me and uh, and i think other people do the same the the people at the very very beginning and i will tell you when i first started when i had the most success is when i had that mm. when i what wasn't successful mm. i told people look if you if you get involved you know, we're going to make money together 
Right. You know, um, and you know, the, before I even had a reputation, because I could hear some people say, "Well, I don't have that reputation." So well, none I'm, of us did. We yeah. Did. How am I? How am yeah. I going to make it happen? Right. Well, at some point, you have to build up enough posture to be able to say to somebody, "Look." We'll do this together, and don't bet against me. It's a bad decision to bet against me because we're gonna yeah. we're gonna go after them. Well, they want leadership. Yeah. And and you don't have to. Leadership, confidence, posture. And it's very simple. I mean, everything changed, and I still remember this phone call, where I was, what took place on it, and I. It was the first phone call where I took that leadership position, and I said, "Here's what you do next. Look, here's how this works. Here's what doesn't work." Here's how we're going to build your business, because it really is just an opportunity, but how you build it is really where the value is found. So if you can just simply tell someone, I know this is new to you, but here's what we're going to do, one, two, three, four, here's what you need to do next, that's all that's required. Yep. If you're able to do that on a phone call with someone, you're the expert, you're the leader, now they're going to want to work with you. Here's what we need to do next. Yeah. To guide them down the road. And I will tell you, yeah. a combination of that and modeling, one of the things that I did is I started, there was one guy who came from corporate America. Mm -hmm. Um, that that became part of my company early on, mm. and I always were dealing with these people that worked for big companies, and they were just so cool. And they were just really full of themselves, and they were really arrogant and a lot of ego. And I didn't know what to do with it because I was a young guy. Right. But I watched this one of the guys that I respected inside of that company, how he dealt with it. He was just like, look, he had so much posture. Right. With somebody like that. I literally copied what he said when I got that attitude from somebody. I copied what he said word for word right. when I was 24. Right. And I just said, "Look, you know, to these people who are 42 sure. and had been working inside a big company for, yeah. for forever, and I got the same exact result. Right. Just by basically mimicking the posture and mimicking the script, not the, the word for word script, but mimicking what he was saying to him. Is you know, look, I know as well as you know that." Your life inside that corporation isn't a bed of roses, and you have to deal with politics, and you have to deal with a lot of infighting and back, yeah. you know, backstabbing, and you're not getting paid what you're worth, and you know, I, I don't try and sell me a picture because I know what you're really dealing with, right? You know, and I know you'd like to be on your own, and I know you're not getting paid what you're worth, but so come on, let's go. So I would say that it's 24, 25 year old, right. and they would say, yeah, you know what, kid, you're right. Yeah. Okay, you're smart for being <laughs> such a young guy. And I was just mimicking what some, somebody that was 40 years old said. Well, what, what that really is, you know, whenever you get an objection in, uh, in this industry, I don't care who the person is, uh, they're doing it subconsciously. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really is, is they're, they're testing you to yep. see whether or not you're really a leader like you are pretending to be yeah. or if you're just faking it. And that's what an objection is designed to do. And they want to find out, hey, if I'm going to follow this guy, he better be the real deal or it's going to cost me in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. And it's going to be a bad decision. So, And subconsciously, they're not consciously testing you. They're just no, subconsciously they're just throwing testing. that out there and they want to see how you respond. And if you don't respond in the way that you did, then... Then boom, they'll run you over. Instantly done. I got run yeah. over by everybody. Yeah, well, that's the only way you ever figure this out. And yeah. And I never really knew what that was about. That was, again, coming to, to study, you know, attraction psychology and things like that as I finally understood, oh. Did you change your image at all? Um, you know, it wasn't intentional. Um, I, I still remember the day that I went and bought my, my first $200 pair of designer jeans and, and <laughs> you know. And I remember the first $1,000 suit. The yeah, magic yeah. of a thousand dollar suit, man. Yeah. Your life never the same after you do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that's, that's cool. And, and, a lot of people have, you know, probably read Robert Kiyosaki's books or know him very well, and he's a big mentor of mine, and he's always said that he lives beyond his, his financial means in the beginning, but not beyond his, what he expected of himself. Right. Like, he lived the reality that he knew he was going to create, even though he couldn't afford it at so the time. So it's a prosperity mindset type of a thing. And that's what I've always had. I mean, I've never been afraid to go out and, and get the car, get the clothes, or whatever that I was congruent with who I was in my head, though it may not be physically yet, yep. um, because if you're congruent with that and you live it, you'll live into it. Yeah. And um, so I've always, always made it made it a point to, here's what I envision in my head, to go make it a reality in as many little ways as possible, whether it's through the clothes, the watch, the car, the house, whatever it may be, because you always, your subconscious always finds a way to, if that's where you're congruent, that's where your thermometer's set at, 
subconscious finds a way to get your reality to that point as well. Well, and I'll tell you what I did too. I, I did a combination of that. But I also said early on, I'm going to become world class. Yeah. Inside of network marketing, right. I'm going to become world class. So I'm going to find all the world class people and I'm going to suck every ounce of value I can get out of them. I'm going to get a good idea from you. Boom, I'm going to use it yeah. and I'm going to put it into my, right. you know, my lineup of value and then I'm going to find the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. That's what this show can be for you, I hope, right. is that you take good ideas and then you, you know, put them into your persona to be able to create a better future. Yeah. So, um, look, I know you got to go and, uh, and we're, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but we've sure. a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, building value is what we're talking about here. Yeah. If you build value, people want to work with you. If you build value, people in your organization will do more than if you don't. Uh, a lot of this is about becoming a student, becoming attractive. Absolutely. Um, becoming interesting, right. become, becoming a person of influence. Right. Uh, some of that's through books, yours and others. Some of that's through programs. Some of that's through modeling, learning from other people, mimicking other people. That was big for me. Absolutely. Same here. That's you know, my, I spent so much time listening to my mentors on the phone with personal sponsors and how they spoke that I literally talk like they do now. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's... You get a little piece of that and you go, oh, okay, that person, you can tell that they their were energy, a... energy, their posture. Yeah, yeah, yeah They're a the Jim Rohn disciple. Or yeah. They're a this person disciple yeah. or whatever it happens to be. Um, well, let's do this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I want to ask you one question that I like to ask of everybody that I have on. Um, most people have a defining moment. Mm in their life or several defining moments. I've had dozens of defining moments where literally you take a right turn or a left turn, you know, and your life is completely different. Uh, when it comes to your network marketing professional career, was there a defining moment for you? Did something did something stick out as a moment that changed you? There's a couple. Yeah. I'm gonna try and I'll try and nail it down to one or two. Um, one was uh, was was reading a, an Anthony Robbins quote. Uh, that I'm very fond of, that is, uh, everything you need is already within you. Yeah. And it was kind of surrendering to that mm. um, and, to, and to realize that that is actually true. Um, everything you need is already within you. Yeah, to, okay. to do whatever you want. And, and we all think that there's outside influences around us that are keeping us in the box. There's with, tools, with other but there's nothing holding you back. Right. Yeah. So it was, it was really internalizing that and surrendering to that. And, and then the other would be, uh, you know, in Dallas, probably the lowest point in my life uh, in this process. You know, been in the industry five, six years. Family thinks I'm nuts. You know, I'm in my 20s now. My friends have nice jobs and, and whatever. And all they want for me to do is get a real job and get some money. I've been living in an apartment with no furniture for years now. Right. And, um, and it was just driving home on the highway, you know, right here, 70, 71, 77 in Dallas, and uh, just mad breakdown, mm. and uh, in the car, and, and uh, just, you know, extremely emotional time, and it's like, you know what, I, I just ha I, I can't take this anymore, stress level wise. Tell, tell me what wise. happened in the car, because I had an uh, almost identical experience. I mean, it just, that was it, it's like the pressure, I put so much pressure on myself for so many years with no results to show for it. That I was just, you know, an emotional breakdown, just mm -hmm. yelling, crying, whatever. Yeah, I was, uh, I was mad at God. I was like, you know, come on, give this kid a break. Oh, I was pissed. <laughs> you and, know, and, and yeah. God, God was really actually some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers, and the unanswered yeah. prayer, yeah, 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 for me was I had to work on me. And but anyway, so well, well, now the, 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 I mean, the end result of that is, is like, um, get so you, did you pull over? No, I just, didn't need to it was just kind of, you know, yeah, I was probably stuck in traffic, but, okay. but you know, I mean, the end result of that was that I kind of let the emotional pressure that I put on myself go, and I just said, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know what, I'm just going to keep trying it, and I'll, if I get results, great, if I don't, great, whatever, but I took all that, that pressure off of myself, and uh, at that point, that really had a huge change, because now when I talk to prospects, yeah, I didn't care if they joined me or not anymore. It's so important to emotionally detach. I'm just it? like, so I don't, you know what? I'm, I'm so over this now. I'm, I'm going to kill myself or get a heart attack if I keep putting this pressure on me. So I was like, I just don't give a shit. Right. And I, the people I talked on the phone was like, hey, this, this is what it is. If you don't like it, or I yeah, that's that. when I started saying, you know, you, this, you're probably not right for me. When I started giving myself permission to 
Say no to them. Say no to them. And then all of a sudden you have the power. And then that little that I know is a whole part of the attraction marketing thing is, you know, one of the best things you can do is let the prospect know that I don't care if you join me or not. This isn't about me making a sale. This is about me deciding start that a I'm going to spend my time with you. Yeah. And uh, why should I do that? What do you have to offer me as, yeah. instead of someone else? And that flips the whole dynamic. Yeah. And all of a sudden, when they, they start see selling. that you don't care yeah. and that you're willing to walk away, that's when they're willing to say, oh, man, you know, okay. And gee, what do you know? You start scoring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, so I'd have to say that's that's. That was a real ones. big click. Huh? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, me too. I, 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 I have the emotional thing where I pulled over the side of the road, got out of the car, yelled up at the sky. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole deal, for real. And then felt like an idiot, got back in the car and kept driving and said, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm still waiting for the answer. And the answer really was I had to develop myself. Yeah. Uh, but I will tell you, getting to the point where you can emotionally detach from an outcome when you talk to a prospect and flip the dynamic yeah. and say, what do you have to offer this organization versus right. selling yourself to them constantly, constantly, constantly. Yeah. Is so important. I can't overemphasize same with, that. Same with downline members. Yeah. I mean, you get to a point where people leave, they go to another company, and these are your friends that you spend time with, and they're producing your income. I love you anyway. And it's like, yeah, it's it's like, okay, and it's just a part of business. I mean, yeah. business is challenges every day and overcoming those challenges. And um, I mean, my top producer at the time brought in hundreds and hundreds of people into my group, just, you know, left one day. I didn't care. It doesn't matter because it's not going to change the long-term end result. And if you're not willing to to deal with the little challenges, and that was a big one, it didn't end the friendship. The punches, probably no, right? no, no, not at all. It's just yeah. like, hey, you know, good, but it's it didn't change. I wasn't emotionally attached to yeah. to the process, and I can't tell you you've been the same way. How many big leaders you've talked to since then that you could have expressed an interest in working with you in your business? I mean, it happens all the time, and I literally forget to call them ever again. And I, I don't, I just don't care anymore because it's not going to ultimately have an impact on my end result. People will still call, and people will still, yeah. you know, it's it, yeah. it, it, it puts you in a place where you, as a professional, put value in you. Right. You develop your own internal self-esteem, and if people see that value, fantastic. And if they don't, it's okay. That's their journey. Right. You know, once you can get there, you can get really powerful. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, well, look. I appreciate you spending it. It's 8 million degrees outside 100, right 105, now. 105 degrees outside. We dragged this uh, umbrella over to give us a little bit of protection out by the swimming pool here. Uh, so Mike's you know, gracious enough to do this, and um, he's got to go pick up his, his bride here in a little bit. But what kind of closing thoughts? These people that watch this program mm -hmm. every day, right. they want this really bad. Right. They want to become network marketing professionals. They want to turn this this profession into something that they're proud of. Mm -hmm. They can they can deliver all the best things that our, our profession has. Right. They want that for their families. What would you as they're reinventing themselves and they're developing, they're learning these skills. What kind of advice, what kind of in closing comments would you offer to them? Uh, I'd have to say that more than anything else, you have to master one at least one skill set and whatever it is that interests you most. Whether it is generating leads online, whether it is presenting on stage or in front of a crowd of people or, you know, kicking butt on the telephone, you have to master one skill set uh, to get results of any kind. And um, and to become world class, you have to develop a half a dozen skill sets. But yeah, but the results start with one. Yeah. You're not going to get results doing anything low class or mediocre. Yeah. Uh, so you have to get world class at one skill. Again, pick it, whatever it may be for you. Um, and at that point, you're going to get results. And when you're getting results, that's just going to compound into each other and kind of roll and give you momentum. And, and you just continue to develop from that process. So, you know, if, if you're not sponsoring people and if you're not building an organization right now, it's because you don't have any value to offer anybody. And that sounds like a crappy thing to hear. But that is the truth. If you're having trouble sponsoring people, it means they don't see any value in working with you. So how do you change that? You go master at least one skill set. And as soon as you know how to do that and, and control that and, and whatever it may be, now you have value to offer someone. Yep. Then you go master another one. And that's bring more that value. gets the ball rolling. Yeah. Right. Sure. I like that. Go master a skill set, then you have value for people. Yeah. And, actually... and things, again, that's just, that gets the ball rolling and gives you the confidence and the results and the feedback that, you know, just help this game become fun. Yeah, you become known for something. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I like sure. It. Yeah. All right. Well, Mike, 
thank you so much. Yeah, this is for great. offering Thanks, offering a little value to the network marketing pro community. Yeah, um, I appreciate your continued support of the profession. And um, here's my wish for you, everyone: is that you decide to become a network marketing professional, that you decide to learn a skill, even if it's just one, to become really good at, master it, that you decide to go pro. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a better way. Let's go tell the world. Here from 8,000 degree <laughs> Dallas, Texas, with, uh, with friend Mike Dillard. Everybody, have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.